So now let's take a look at some recursive Java methods that deal with strings. So my class, I'm going to call recursion with strings, and I'll add some methods to this class that are recursive that work with strings. And I'm going to have two arrays of test data. The first is some integers, and we we'll use that later. And then here's some strings that we'll use to check if our recursive string methods actually work. So the first one we're going to see is reversing a string. Our algorithm to reverse a string is going to be to remove the first character, then reverse the rest of the string, and then append that reversed rest of the string before the first character. So each time we make a recursive call, we're essentially taking what's on the front, putting it on the end, and then recursing in the rest of the string so that it gets reversed as well. So let's trace what that algorithm looks like. Here we have a six character string. So we take the S off and make a recursive call on the rest of the string. And we continue doing that until the length of the rest of the string is zero, which would mean there's no characters left. And so then we start building this string back up. So we take that string and it gets returned to the caller and it gets appended before whatever the first character was when that method got called. So then we have this reverse string. We return that and we append it before the first character in that string. And we repeat this again and again. So here we return this reverse string. We append it before what was the first character there. Return, append before the first character. So finally, at this point, we've reversed the rest of the string and all that's left is that first character. And again, remember, we append that reversed rest of the string with the first character. And so now you can see this reverses that string. So that's the algorithm. Now let's take a look at how we would implement that in code. So all of these are going to be static methods for two reasons. Number one, we're going to be testing those with our main method and our main method is static. And so we'll need to have static methods in order to call in it from another static method. And the second reason is, is these aren't going to use any class members. And so they are standalone methods. And so there's no reason for them to not be static. And we'll call this reverse string and we'll take a string as a parameter. Let's add a comment here to say what we're doing, and we want to return a string, not a void. So our base case is going to be if the string length is less than or equal to 1, then we're going to return the string. And notice this will also work for a null string. Because its length is less than 1, it'll get returned. You can return the null string. In our recursive case, we're going to reverse the rest of the string. So there's a method in Java called substring, and you'll notice there's a couple different versions. I can either start at an index or I can give it a start and end index if I want to, for example, take off the front and the end of a string if I want something in the middle. But for our purposes, since we just want the rest of the string, this one will work for us. And so that beginning index is going to be one because we're going to remove the first character, which is at index zero, and then we're going to append the character that was at index zero to the end of our result. A couple of things here. This is absolutely not an efficient method. In fact, there is a Java string reverse method built in. So if, if you want to reverse a string, that's what you're going to do. Another thing is we're doing a lot of string appends, which are slow. The point of writing this is not so much to write an efficient string reverse method. It is to see how we can use recursion to solve different problems. So just keep that in mind. Again, this is an example of recursion, not so much an example of working with strings. So let's write some test code. So to start off with, I'll print a header, and then I'll print a for each loop that takes each string in our test array and reverses it. And we'll print a blank line at the end, and I'm missing a plus sign right here. Okay, so let's uh, run this code and see if it works. And it does not. So I see what my problem is. Notice here, if I match up these parentheses, I'm reversing the string, but I'm appending the first character inside this function call. So what I really need to do is close that. So now you can see I'm just passing the substring of one, and then I append the character and I'll need to remove one of these parentheses to maintain balance. So that's a very easy mistake to make. And I know that for a fact, because when I first wrote this to make sure I had everything working, 
I ran into the same mistake and I was tra watching out for it and I even checked for it and I still made it. So um, be very careful when you're when you're working with parentheses, make sure you're balanced at the right place. So you can see Eclipse will actually tell you what parentheses matches with the current parentheses. And so now you can see that we are effectively reversing the strings. So for our next recursive string method, we'll check to see if a string contains a character. So our algorithm there will have a base case. If the string is empty, it's not there. We'll have another base case. If the first character in that string is what we're looking for, then we return true. And then our recursive case, in any other case, if the string isn't empty and the first character is not what we're looking for, we're going to look for the character in the substring starting at index one. So the way this works, here I have a string. Does it contain R? Well, S is not R and the string is not empty. So now we're going to make a recursive call on the rest of the string. So the string is not empty. The first character is not R. So we're going to make a recursive call on the rest of the string. When we do that, the string is not empty, and the first character is what we're looking for, so we're done. So let's see what this looks like in code. And we're going to return a Boolean here, and we'll pass a string and a character. So we have three cases. If the string length is less than one, then it doesn't exist, so we're going to return false. If this character at index zero in string is equal to C, the character we're looking for, then we're going to return true. And that should be an else as well. Otherwise, we're going to return not true or false. We're going to return whether or not the substring starting at index one contains the character we're looking for. And again, we want to make sure that we have our parentheses set up right and we'll pass C to that recursive call. Okay, again, maybe surprising how little code this is since we're doing recursion. Although realistically, if it was a for loop, it would be less lines of code. Just like with reversing a string, this is not the best way to do this. Again, the point of this is to give you an example of recursively looking through a string. And remember, if I wanted to take things off the end of the string, this is a start index and I can also pass an end index. I just, in this case, did not want to do that. So let's do our test code and we can just copy and paste the same test code that we have, except we'll change this to contains. And we'll say that, or actually we'll ask, does string S contain, and we'll look for an A. Oops, not the variable A. We're looking for the character A. Okay, and I think that all looks good. Except that I want to put this print line back up here. And let's run this. So that we should remove that. And we'll add a question mark here. And notice when we print a Boolean, it'll say true or false. So after that little bit of cleanup, it should be a little nicer to look at. So the first string contains A, the second string doesn't, the third string does. For our last example, we're not actually going to work with a string, but we are going to print something out. We're going to write a recursive method that prints a square. And what we're going to do is we're going to create a helper function, and that's actually what we're going to call. That'll be our recursive function that will keep track of what row we're currently printing. So our algorithm is going to be when someone calls our square method with a integer representing how many rows of that square they need. You could also call it the side of the square. Then we're going to first call a helper function that's going to include the side and also the fact that we need to print the first row. And then our recursive case is going to be if the row is less than or equal to the number of sides, we're going to print a row. Otherwise, we're going to stop. So the way this works, we'll call square three, which we'll call a helper method square three one, because we're going to start with printing the first row. We'll print the first row. Then we'll call square three two, which is our current row plus one. We'll print out a second row because two is less than or equal to three. And then we'll add one to the current row and call square three, three. We'll print out a row because three is less than or equal to three. And then we'll call square three, four. Now at this point, we'll actually stop recursing because four is greater than or equal to three. 
So our row is greater than the number of rows we want to print, and so we'll stop, and that'll be our base case. So let's write this method. So this will be a, a void method that'll have one parameter for the number of sides. And this is an example of recursion with a helper function. So we'll start off, we'll write a function that takes a side, and then it'll call an overloaded function that adds the current row to that side. Now, a couple of things here is notice we're not actually returning anything. In a lot of the recursive functions we've seen so far, we've seen a return value of an int or a string or even a Boolean. Here, we're not actually returning anything because we're just doing something recursively and then we'll stop at some point. So we'll stop doing that thing when we reach our base case. So if the current row is less than or equal to the side, then we're going to print a row and I want to do a print line at the end because I'm printing here so that these all show up on the same row and then I'm done I'll print line to go to the next row and again I want to do this inside the if condition because this is my recursive case if the current row is less than or equal to the side I'm going to print and then I'm going to make a recursive call so I'll call print square and I'll add one to the current row and you could also do this in the opposite direction. I could pass side here and start at the higher row and go down to zero. So while that current row is greater than zero print, either way is fine. It doesn't really make any difference. Now you may wonder, where is our base case? Does this recursive function have a base case? Because every recursive function has to have one. And in fact, it does. If side is less than current row, do nothing. So we don't actually need to explicitly say that because if that happens, this if condition never executes. And so this function does nothing for the base case. So we don't need that explicit base case here. We have something that'll handle that fine. So now let's write our test code here. So if you'll remember, we have these this array of values and we'll actually iterate through that array just like we did with our string test array. And we'll make a square of each of those sizes. And then we'll call print square. So now let's test our code. Okay, so we have some errors. I don't really need a opening brace there. So now let's try this. Still some errors. Okay, that looks better. And then we run this, we see we get a square of size one, a square of size three, and a square of size six. So hopefully this example gives you some better understanding of how to design and write recursive functions. Again, the possibilities here are limitless. However, the one thing to keep in mind is you don't always have to use recursion. A lot of these examples you can do much more efficiently or much more cleanly without using recursion. Here we're just doing a bunch of examples so that you see how recursion works. Now, some of the examples recursion really makes your life a lot easier. If you look at, for example, the maze traversal or the solving the towers of Hanoi problem, that's a really effective use of, of recursion to simplify code. So the key is to remember that recursion is a tool. Use it when it's appropriate.